You may start. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody, and happy Thanksgiving to our American friends. Enjoy and also enjoy listening to the talks. We continue with Michael lectures on Rory Alverson space. Michael, please. My dear, thanks for the introduction. Uh, thank you all for coming, especially uh, those of you who, who join uh, on a holiday. So happy American Thanksgiving uh, to everyone. Um, yeah, so, so let me uh, uh, pick up where I left, uh, left off yesterday, uh, which, uh, which was I introduced these, these pick spaces, um, which uh, are roughly speaking spaces in which pick's theorem is true. And I try to convince you that there is a sort of a reformulation of this pick condition in terms of extending multipliers from, from subsets to the whole thing. So the, um, the, uh, the one thing you should, uh, you should pay attention to on this slide here is just this, uh, uh, this, this bit here. So uh, at least at level one, the, uh, the pick condition means that for every multiplier that's defined on a subset, uh, you get an extension uh, to the entire uh, space. Uh, that uh, has the same multiplier norm. So it's this multiplier extension property. Okay, and uh, so last time I think I explained why this is the case. Uh, so let me skip this and instead uh, talk about the question of which kernels uh, are complete pick kernels or which spaces are complete pick spaces, right? I'm, I'm using these two things uh, interchangeably. Uh, so I, I need another uh, little bit of uh, terminology, namely uh, a function f uh, of two variables, so this bivariate function, is, uh, is positive if whenever you take endpoints uh, in your underlying set X and you form this N by N matrix, uh, then you get a positive semi-definite matrix out of it. So, so we've seen this in, uh, uh, in, in other talks and it's convenient to, to have this, uh, this shorthand formulation. And then there is a theorem which is uh, usually called the, uh, the McCulloch Wiggins theorem. But uh, as far as I know in this uh, formulation that I'm stating it here, uh, it's, uh, it's due to Agvan McCarthy. And uh, it characterizes which kernels are complete pick kernels. So the, um, let's assume we have a non-vanishing kernel K. And then uh, this uh, theorem says that this K is a complete pick kernel if and only if there exists uh, a point Z in your underlying set X, so that this function here, one minus this, uh, this ratio is, is positive in the, sense, uh, in, in the sense described above. And if it's positive for one Z, then it's positive for all Z uh, in, in the underlying set. Uh, so let me comment a little bit on this. Uh, so first of all, how should you read this, um, this fraction here that, that's on the right? Well, uh, I think a, a convenient way of reading it is, is to group terms like this. So uh, you should think that of this as essentially being one over the kernel, uh, but then uh, you rescale or you multiply by this rank one uh, kernel that I've just circled in. And uh, I'll uh, get back to this interpretation in a minute. Um, let me also uh, comment on this assumption of non-vanishing kernel. Uh, so this means that k of xy is non-zero for all choices of x and y. Um, in the case of pick kernels, this turns out to be a harmless assumption because uh, it turns out that if you have a pick kernel that vanishes somewhere, then you can break up your set into individual bits so that on each bit, your kernel doesn't vanish and the function spaces corresponding to different bits are orthogonal. So you can always do this decomposition and it's a little bit, so working with non-managing kernels is a little bit like doing complex analysis on connected sets as opposed to general open sets, right? You can write every open set as a union of its connected components, but uh, oftentimes theorems and complex analysis become cle uh, cleaner uh, if you just assume connectedness from the beginning. And, and so it's similar here. So this is essentially like assuming connectedness. So, um, I'm going to, to make a couple of comments about this uh, theorem as we go forward, but let me point out that there is a, a very clean and, and simple proof of necessity of this theorem that was recently obtained by, by Greg Neese. So if you want to learn about this, uh, I recommend checking out his paper. It's a, I think it's a one or two page argument. Um, now this becomes even, even cleaner if you assume in addition that uh, your kernel is normalized at a point. Uh, so you assume that there is some point X naught in your domain uh, so that kx x naught is equal to one uh, for every point x. And um, so again, this is a, a fairly harmless assumption because you can always renormalize non-vanishing kernels and this doesn't change the multipliers, but also many kernels you encounter in nature already are normalized at the point. So if you think as, as of the Dreyerusen kernel as an example, uh, one over one minus z inner product w, 
then this is normalized at zero, right? Because if you choose W to be zero, then you get one. Um, so you can think of this point X naught as essentially playing the role of the origin in this, uh, in this case. And then uh, what you can do is you just take uh, this point Z in this uh, mccullough quiggin theorem uh, to be uh, the normalization point. Uh, and, and then you get this, this uh, uh, very clean characterization that uh, the kernel is a complete pick kernel if and only if uh, one minus one over the kernel is positive. Because then this, uh, this, this entry that I circled uh, is, is, is just equal to one in the, in the normalized case. Okay. So what can you do with this then? Well, what you can do, well, one thing you can do with it is you can prove that a whole bunch of things are complete pick spaces. So here are some examples. Um, if you believe this theorem as a black box, uh, then you can show that the Duralison space is a complete pick space. Because if you look at one minus one over the kernel, then this is just Z in our product W. And that's uh, sort of the prototypical example of a positive function, right? Because if you take this, uh, if you form this N by N matrix by plugging in points, uh, then what you get is the, uh, is the matrix of inner products of these points are so also known as the, the Gram matrix, right? And, and so these Gram matrices are always uh, positive semi-definite because they have to form A star A. Um, so in particular, you know, you know if you, uh, you can see that this uh, mccullough quiggin theorem contains a PICS original theorem as a special case because uh, this applies when, when D equals one. Um, we can also prove that a whole bunch of other spaces are complete PICS spaces. And so the ones that I want to briefly mention are these uh, spaces in the scale that I introduced in the, in the first lecture. Um, namely for, for every uh, number A bigger than zero, we had this, uh, let's just do it on the disk. So there we have this uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space on the disk whose kernel was, it was a power of the Zego kernel, right? And uh, then you can, it, it, it follows from this mccullough quiggin theorem that this guy is a complete pig space uh, if and only if your, um, your index A is, between, is uh, less than or equal to one, right? So, so A equals one corresponds to Hardy space. Uh, A less than one corresponds to some weighted Dirichlet spaces. Uh, so they turn out to be complete pig spaces. Uh, but for instance, the case A equals two corresponds to Bergman space, excuse me, which is then not a complete pig space. And uh, so let me actually show you this computation because I think it's, it's sort of remarkably simple. And um, uh, so here, here's how it goes. So you take, you look at um, one minus one over the kernel, uh, which, is, uh, which is this function, and then you expand it into a binomial series. Right? So, so you get these binomial coefficients, a choose n, uh, where, where I'm reminding you a choose n is, uh, is, is this, um, this expression here. And, uh, it's an easy exercise to show that if you have a, a, a function on, uh, sorry, if you have a power series in ZW bar, then this defines a positive function in this, uh, in the sense I described earlier, if and only if all these coefficients are, are positive or non-negative real numbers, I should say. So then when you stare at this long enough, then, then you see what's going on, right? Because if, if A is less than or equal to one, then uh, if you look at this, uh, this, this coefficient H U N, the first factor is always uh, non-negative, uh, but all the remaining ones are, are negative. And so there's n minus one of them. So once you multiply by minus one to the n minus one, then you see that all of them are, are greater than or equal to zero. So you get the complete pick property from the uh, mccullough quiggin theorem. Uh, and conversely, uh, if a is bigger than one, then for instance, you can look at the, uh, the second coefficient. So, so a choose two. So, so a choose two is then positive if, if a is bigger than one. Uh, so once you multiply by, by minus one, it becomes negative. Uh, so, so that fails the complete pick property. Uh, so one reason why I'm showing this is, uh, is because I think it shows how, how powerful this, uh, this theorem is, especially in this uh, formulation with a normalized kernel, right? Because usually uh, proving something like a pick theorem is, uh, is not easy, but uh, this may call a quicken theorem, at least in these uh, examples, um, more or less reduces it to a calculus one homework problem, right? Because you just have to check certain inequalities for the coefficients. Um, you might also remember if in some sense, if you take uh, the limit as A goes to zero here, uh, then you get the, uh, the classical unweighted Dirichlet space. And uh, this also is a complete pick space. And the computation, you can prove it using this mccullough quiggin theorem, but the computation is a bit more complicated, so I'm not gonna show it. Um, but actually, this uh, predates the, the mccullough quiggin theorem. So this is a theorem of, of Agler from 1988, um, where uh, he, he sort of shows directly that the classical Dirichlet space is a complete pick space. And so, so Quiggin says in his paper, for instance, that he was influenced by, uh, 
uh, this this argument of of, of Agus. So, so I think this uh, this theorem of Agus is really what what got the whole thing started. So so one takeaway message here is that uh, there are uh, complete pick spaces that uh, people care about independently uh, of uh, of this uh, you know uh, development of this of this theory. For instance, there's three hours in space and the the classical Dirichlet space, which of course we learned about in uh, in Tom Ransford's lectures. Okay. Um, so I said for necessity in this McCullough Quicken theorem, you should uh, you should consult Greg Nies. Um, uh, let me briefly comment on sufficiency because it involves uh, another idea which is of, of independent interest and uh, and that's of, of realization formula. So so we saw, um, I think realization formulas last week in, in Mike Joy's talk and in yesterday in, in Michael Drizzle's talk. So um, yeah, so, just, so I guess I'm the, I'm the third Michael to talk about this within one week or so, but uh, let me let me still mention it briefly. Um, so you can do this. What I'm going to tell, uh, what I'm going to say, whenever the one minus one over k is uh, is oops, sorry, you can do this whenever one minus one over k is uh, is positive. But let me just do it in the case of the Dirichlet space uh, because there the formulas become a bit cleaner, and uh, that's that's sort of the, the 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 main object of interest for us right now anyway. So um, suppose you have sorry. I think this works. Sorry about that. So if you have a um, a subset y of the ball and, and a function phi that's defined on y, uh, then uh, two things turn out to be equivalent. Uh, so the first one is that uh, phi is a multiplier on y of multiplying norm at most one. So so this is also the same as saying that this function one minus phi of z uh, phi of w bar divided by one minus z in our product w is, is positive in this sense. Uh, that I described earlier. That's the first point. And the second point is you have what's known as a, as a network realization formula. So there exists a Hilbert space uh, uh, E and, and the unitary operator from E direct sum C into E to the D direct sum C so that if you partition it as this two by two block operator, uh, then you can write phi as, as a fractional linear transformation in these entries uh, of this unitary operator U. And so this Z of Z here is, is just the row of the ZI, so Z1 through ZD. And then maybe, maybe you ask, well, why does this inverse make sense? Well, the inverse makes sense because um, U is a, is a unitary. So this, uh, this one by one, so this one one piece A is in particular a contraction. Uh, so once you multiply by Z of Z, it becomes a strict contraction for every Z in the, in the open bar. And so you can, you can form this inverse by, uh, by Neumann series, for instance. And so this almost looks like a Möbius transformation, right? And, and in some sense, it's, it's a Möbius transformation, but with, with, uh, with operator coefficients. And so, so this is quite remarkable uh, because it gives a, uh, in some sense, fairly simple form uh, of, uh, of an arbitrary multiplier. And I should say, so in, for the Dreyavison space, this is due to Baltrand and Vinnikoff, uh, but in the case uh, of D equals one, this actually goes back to, uh, to the engineering literature. So in control theory, people care about when this, uh, this transfer function is an in ancient infinity because it has to do with the stability of your control system. Okay, so one thing you can do with this theorem is that uh, you can uh, give a quick proof of the uh, um, uh, pick property of the Dreyavison space, because what you do is you start with pick data, which is defined on, uh, on your subset Y. So think of it as a finite set, if you like. And then you apply this implication, one implies two, um, which says that if you, if you start with this, then you get a realization. Now the realization uh, holds by definition for all Z and Y, but uh, the basic observation is that the right-hand side actually makes sense for all Z in the ball. Uh, and then you just use that formula to extend uh, phi to the ball. You call this extension capital phi, and then you apply the reverse, uh, but now with uh, Y equals the whole ball. And then the reverse says that uh, the, the extension is, uh, is also a contractive multiplier. Right, so in some sense, once you know this, then uh, the extension uh, sort of stares at you. You just uh, take this formula, which makes sense on, on, on the whole ball, and, and you extend it this way. Okay, so uh, where do we use that we have the Dreyavison space or this positivity assumption? Um, well, the, the way that this is usually proved is uh, it uses something known as the, the lurking isometry argument. And uh, to make this lurking isometry argument work, you need certain things to look like inner products. And, and so the crucial thing turns out that this thing in the bottom here is, uh, looks like an inner product. Um, if you want to learn more about this lurking isometry argument, uh, 
Uh, there's a recent book by uh, Agla McCarthy and Young called Operator Analysis, where they really uh, explain this lurking isometry argument uh, uh, really nicely. So you can look at that. Okay, so we know that the Dre Avison space is a complete pick space. And um, what I'm going to try to convince you of next is that it's not just any old example, that it's actually uh, universal in a certain sense. And so here I'm just uh, restating this, uh, this theorem of, of McCullough and Quiggin uh, in this version of Agla McCarthy for normalized kernels. So this is what I, what I just uh, had earlier. Um, and then a key observation you can make is you can apply it to this positive function one minus one over K, uh, what's known as the Kolmogorov factorization. So the Kolmogorov factorization says that every positive function essentially looks like a Gramian. Uh, it looks like B of X in a product B of Y for some map B that takes your underlying set X into some Hilbert space E. And, and then you rearrange. Uh, and then what you get is this theorem of Wagner McCarthy, which says that if you have a, a normalized reproducing kernel, so a Hilbert space with a normalized reproducing kernel, uh, then it's a complete pick space if and only if there is some Hilbert space E and the map from the underlying set X into E uh, that, that uh, well, it takes it into the open unit bar and you can write your kernel K as uh, one over one minus B of X now part of B of Y. So, so, so this shows why it's, uh, why it's crucial to have uh, the right formulation of this, of this theorem so that you can actually uh, see this here. And so the fact that B of X maps to the open ball just follows from taking uh, X equals Y here. Um, and uh, so this is an if and only if because a uh, function is positive if and only if it has such a Kolmogorov factorization. So then you can observe that this essentially looks like the Dray-Avison space kernel came up, right? Because the Dray-Avison space kernel was one over one minus Z in a product W. And so this looks like the Dray-Avison space kernel composed with B. And uh, I'll explain in a minute what this uh, what this means for the function spaces, but you can already see that for the kernels, uh, the Dre Allison kernel is in some sense universal, right? You can recover any complete pick kernel uh, uh, in it by, uh, by doing this construction here. Now, you can make your life a bit easier, which I want to do, and then you can assume two more things. Um, I'm going to assume that H separates the points of X, uh, which translates to saying that uh, B is an injective map. Uh, so you can really think of, of B as an embedding of X into uh, the unit bar of some Hilbert space. And I also want to assume that the function space is separable, uh, which means that you can take E to be separable as well. And so E is either C to the D or little l2. Okay. So if E is equal to C to the D, then this is literally the Dray-Allison kernel that we have. Uh, but if E is little l2, then okay, we need to extend the definition of the Dray-Allison space. Uh, so this is what I want to do next. Uh, so I'm going to write B infinity for the open unit ball in little l2. And uh, then you can define the Dre Allison space on the open unit ball to be the reproducing kernel Hilbert space uh, whose reproducing kernel is uh, this familiar formula, one over one minus Z in our product W. And the only observation is that this makes sense on the open ball of little l2 as well. Um, so this is sort of a, a version of the Dre Allison space in infinitely many variables. And uh, many of the things carry over, but you need to be somehow careful. I mean, there are some things that uh, don't quite work out the same way. And uh, in particular, uh, certain points of view are missing. So as far as I know, there's no good uh, function theoretic description of, these, uh, of this uh, Ray-Allison space on the infinite dimension ball. Either way, you can make this, uh, this definition. And um, then you can reformulate uh, this uh, relationship on the kernels as a statement about the function spaces. So if, you, if the kernel ha has uh, this uh, representation here, then this just translates to saying that you get an isometry from your complete pick space into the Dre Allison space that maps the reproducing kernel of the complete pick space uh, to the corresponding uh, kernel of the Dre Allison space. And so, so this is just a reformulation because if you, uh, this, uh, th this relationship for the kernels here says that if you take the inner product between uh, two kernels on the left, it's the same as taking the inner product between the corresponding kernels on the right. Okay, so, so in this sense, you can embed every um, complete pick space into the Drew Allison space. But it's also useful to take adjoints in the statement. And uh, if you take adjoints, then, then you get this result. So if you take the adjoint of, uh, of V, then you get uh, a composition operator. And so the adjoint of an isometry is a core isometry. Uh, so a surjective partial isometry. And, uh, and then you get this. So if you have a normalized complete pick space, uh, 
then you can find some number d which might be infinity so this is this is one caveat and uh, and the map b uh, from x into the ball in d dimensions so that a composition with this map induces a quasi-symmetric composition operator from the Dirac in space into the uh, the complete pig space so if this is your point of view then uh, the, the thing to say is that every complete pig space is a quotient of the Dirac in space because you have this uh, this quasi-symmetry into h um, there's also a companion fact for multipliers, um, which says that, that this uh, composition by B gives you a complete quotient map on the level of multipliers. And so in particular at level one, this means that if you start with a multiplier on H, then you can lift it to a multiplier of the Dirac-Allison space. Uh, so that composition with uh, B recovers your original multiplier. So uh, part A is really just a reformulation of this uh, relationship between kernels. And uh, part B is, um, more or less the complete pick property of the Dirac in space. Because if you have a multiplier on the subset, then um, you can, uh, it corresponds to a, sorry, if you have a multiplier on, on X, then it corresponds to some multiplier on the image of, of X under this map B. And then by the complete pick property, you can extend it to a multiplier on the whole bar. So, 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 so part B is essentially uh, the, the complete pick property of, uh, of the Dirac in space. Okay. So this shows that you know the Dirac-Allison space is a universal complete pick space, uh, at least if you allow d equals infinity here, uh, because every other space is a quotient and every other multiplier algebra is a, is a complete quotient of the multiplier algebra of the Dirac-Allison space. Now you can run with this a little further, um, and so uh, the first thing you can do is you can um, just do an, another reformulation, which is instead of taking the whole Dirac-Allison space, you just look at uh, the restriction of your functions to the subset, uh, which you can give the quotient norm always. Uh, and then in this setting, uh, what you get is that uh, you get a unitary map from this restriction space into the complete pig space. So this is just another way of phrasing uh, what was on the previous slide. Uh, the point is once you take the restriction and the map becomes injective. And, and so if it's inject injective quasi-symmetry, then it's unitary. Um, the advantage of this point of view is that you can work a bit harder to show that you don't need to consider arbitrary subsets B. And so, uh, so, so here are the, the, uh, the key definitions. Maybe if you have a, a set S of functions in the dirac space, uh, then you can look at the vanishing locus of this set. So this is the set of all points in the ball um, where all your functions in S vanish. And conversely, if you have a set of points in the ball W, you can look at the collection of all Dirac in space functions that vanish on W. And so we say that V is a variety if it's the vanishing uh, set of some collection of functions in the Dirac in space. So these varieties in this sense are, are analytic varieties because these functions are holomorphic, um, but it's a little more restrictive uh, because if you think about it in, uh, in D, if D is one, uh, then you're talking about zero sets of the Hardy space and uh, so these are precisely Blaschka sequences, um, well, and I guess the whole disk. And whereas, uh, you know, analytic varieties in one variable would just be discrete sets uh, in the disk. So it is more restrictive. Um, by the way, it doesn't make a difference if you take uh, functions in the Dirac in space or multipliers uh, that also follows from the complete pick property that there's no difference there. So the key observation here is that uh, you can do essentially something like the Zariski closure and algebraic geometry. So what you can do is if you have an arbitrary subset V or the ball, you can look at the set of all functions that vanish on W. And then you look at the set of all points where those functions vanish. And then you get a variety uh, which certainly contains W, but it might be bigger. And so this is essentially like the Zariski closure. And the point is that on the Hilbert space level, you don't really see the difference. Oh, and I guess there's a, there's a D missing here. So there should be H to D, H to D. Um, so the restriction map from the, uh, the set V onto the set W is, gives you unitary on the level of, uh, of Hilbert function spaces, uh, because it's, I mean, these restrictions are always quasi-symmetries and it has to be injective because if you have a function that vanishes on W, then it vanishes on V by definition. So it's injective. Okay, so if you put all this together, uh, then you get um, an improvement of this uh, uh, theorem I had earlier. And as far as I know, this is uh, this observation is due to Davidson, Ramsey, and Chalit. And it says that if you have any normalized complete pick space, then you can find a variety. So not just any old subset, but a variety in uh, some ball, possibly of infinite dimensions, uh, 
and a map B from X into the variety so that you get a, a, a unitary composition operator. So up to unitary composition operators, which is you know, really the sort of isomorphism in the category of Hilbert function spaces. Um, this is uh, every normalized complete pick space looks like the restriction of the Dreyalison space uh, onto a, a variety. Okay. Um, now there's, again, there's a companion fact for multipliers. Uh, so if you have a unitary on the level of, of Hilbert function spaces, you get a completely isometric isomorphism on the level of multiplier algebras. And um, so, so then you get these algebras M sub V, which you can either think of the multiplier algebra of this uh, space on the variety V, or you can think of it as taking all multipliers on the, on the Dreyavison space and restricting them to the subset V. And uh, the reason why there's no difference in uh, is again, the complete pick property of the Dreyavison space, right? The, the multipliers in the subset extend to multipliers in the whole thing. Okay, so once you realize this, that so that there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between these uh, varieties and, and so complete pick spaces in some sense, then uh, there are some obvious questions. Uh, and for instance, uh, what's the relationship between the operator algebra structure of uh, this uh, algebra MV and the geometry of the variety V? So in particular, uh, maybe you would like to prove uh, things that say something like that the operator algebras are isomorphic in a certain sense, if and only if the varieties are uh, geometrically equivalent in a suitable sense. And so uh, if you want to learn more about this, uh, which I hope you do, uh, then you should just stick around after my talk and uh, listen to Roy Shalit, where he exactly is going to talk about uh, this question here. So just wait half an hour and then uh, you'll have Aura explain this to you. All right. Now, what is this all good for? So now we know that the Dreyavison space is a complete pick space. And uh, we know that it's actually universal. Uh, so what can you do with this? Um, so I thought I'd uh, just select a couple of topics uh, where you can see how, how this is used. And, and then I thought about how to make the selection. And so the criterion I came up with is uh, I went through the uh, program of the last couple of weeks and I tried to uh, select topics that somehow relate to previous weeks. Uh, so if I, if I left out your, your favorite topic, uh, I apologize, but uh, that's, the, um, that's the criterion I came up with. Okay, sorry. So two weeks ago, um, there was a program about the corona problem. Uh, so let me talk about this. Uh, so let's now assume D is finite. That's, uh, that's important. Uh, things get difficult when D is infinity in this case. Let's just assume finite D. Well, then we know that the multiplier algebra is a unital commutative Banach algebra. Uh, so Gelfand theory suggests that we should try to understand its maximum ideal space. So the maximum ideal space, of course, the set of all linear multiplicative non-zero functionals on the uh, multiplier algebra. And uh, well, there are certain maximum ideals or equivalent characters which are, which are obvious, namely point evaluations, right? For every point in the ball, you get the character of point evaluation on that ball. And uh, we learned two weeks ago in, uh, in Alex Budney's talks that Carlson famously proved uh, if D is one, that the unit disk is dense in the maximum ideal space of, of H infinity, right? So if D is one, then this multiplier algebra is H infinity. And so, so this is Carlson's theorem. Now, remarkably, this works in, in, in higher variables. Uh, and there is a, so this is a theorem of Costea, Sawyer, and Wake from about 10 years ago, where they proved that the Corona theorem remains true in, uh, in the Dreyalison space. So the unit ball is dense in the maximal ideal space of the multiplier algebra of the Dreyalison space. So for the Dreyalison space, Corona is no longer a problem. It's a, it's a theorem. And, and as, as Jingbo Shah mentioned in his, uh, in his talk yesterday, uh, one reason why this is uh, remarkable is that this is probably the, um, the first and, and, and perhaps still the only real corona theorem in several variables, right? I mean, the corona problem is open for H infinity of the bar or H infinity of the poly disk, or, well, I may be open. And um, uh, either way, it is still, so I shouldn't say it's, it, 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 it's, it's the only one, but I, I think it's the first uh, corona uh, theorem in several variables. So let me comment on, uh, on, on, the, on the proof here. And so the, um, uh, it, it essentially consists of, of two steps. Uh, in the first step, uh, you use the complete pick property uh, to reduce this problem about the multiplier algebra uh, 
uh, to the problem about uh, to uh, to a problem about the Dury Alveson space. Um, so right, this is originally a problem about the multipliers, and it turns out you can reduce it to a problem about the Hilbert space. Um, I'm going to say a bit more about this in a minute. Um, but then this problem about the Hilbert space becomes a bit easier. It's still very hard, but uh, it is something that Costea, Sawyer, and Wick can solve. So then they solve the, the Dreyavison space problem using the function theory description of the Dreyavison space. So one reason why I'm mentioning this is that this really combines uh, multiple points of view on the Dreyavison space, right? It combines this reproducing kernel point of view, which is, uh, which is where the complete pick property comes from, and it, it combines the, the function theory point of view which they need to solve uh, the hard analysis problem in the end. And, and let me also mention in passing, um, you know, maybe, uh, maybe if you're like me or you have sort of wild dreams that maybe there's a general Corona theorem that works for all complete pick spaces. Um, but uh, this seems uh, somewhat unlikely because um, a couple of years ago with uh, Aleman McCarthy Drechta um, in, a, in a paper, we, um, we constructed or, or we point out that there is a, a complete pick space of holomorphic functions on the disk for which the Corona theorem fall, uh, fails. So the, the, the disk is not dense in the maximum ideal space of the multiplier algebra. And so, so I mean, it's not a, a space of, uh, of functions on a disk of radius bigger than one. I mean, okay, that'd be one way to do it, but that would be silly. No, it is a space of functions uh, that they really live on a disk of radius one, um, yet the disk is not dense in the maximum ideal space. Um, so it does look at, like you need to interface uh, with a function theory of your space uh, in some non-trivial way because uh, uh, it, it doesn't work in complete generality. Uh, let me also mention that uh, this uses a, a construction of, uh, of, of Hector Salas. So he constructed some kind of weighted shift that uh, answered the question of Alan Shields. And uh, turns out you can realize his shift on a complete pick space uh, that, that gives you this in the end. Okay. So what does the, uh, what does the, uh, the complete pick property then do for you in the context of this, uh, of this Corona problem? Well, um, as we also saw in, saw in Alex Bourdain's talks, um, you can rephrase this uh, uh, density of point evaluations in the maximum ideal space uh, in terms of function theory. And so this is, this is essentially sort of an exercise in Gelfand theory and, and the definition of the weak star topology, namely the, uh, the unit ball uh, is dense in the maximum ideal space of the multiplier algebra. If and only if whenever you have n multipliers that are uh, bounded below on the ball, uh, the, um, the ideal they generate in the multiplier algebra is everything. Or in other words, uh, you can find these multipliers Psi1 through Cn so that the sum of Phi i Cn is equal to one. So this is equivalent to this density of, um, of the ball. And so, so this is what you need to solve, so, right? So, so, so we're given n multipliers that are bounded below and you want to show that you can solve this, uh, this busy equation. Now what the complete pick property does is if does for you is it, it translates solvability of this Bizu equation uh, into a Hilbert space problem. And so in the case of the Dreyavison space, this was also proved by, by Baltrand and Vinikov. Um, and if you have a complete pick space, and if you take n functions in the complete pick space, uh, and two things are equivalent. The first one is, is what you want. Uh, the ideal they generate is the whole thing, right? So you can find these multipliers so that phi i psi is equal to one. And the second thing is that the row operator uh, from uh, n copies of, your, of the Dreyavison space into one copy of the Dreyavison space is a subjective map. And so the reason why this is helpful is uh, it translates this problem, the first one about the multiplier algebra into a problem about the Hilbert space. So, so, so this is something that you can try to solve in the Hilbert space, right? You have to show given any function G in the Dreyavison space, it has a pre-image over here. And so just, just to, to give you a feeling, I mean, the, the, um, the obvious implication here is, is one implies two, because if you have these multipliers ci, then you can look at the column of the psi's, and this is a right inverse for the row of, of the fees, right? So, so which gives you subjectivity. Um, but the, but the non-trivial implication is to go from, from two to one, and this is really what the complete pick property does for you. Um, so uh, this is usually proved using either the realization formula or, or uh, coming time lifting uh, theorem. And uh, so, so this reduces the problem, the corona problem for the Dreyavison space to the following. You're given corona data, so, so n multiplies that bounded below. Then you want to show that the multiplication operator is subjective, um, which, as I said, is still a hard problem. Um, it uses a lot of hard harmonic analysis, uh, but it is something that uh, Costia, so anyway, can solve. Uh, let me also mention that this, uh, so, so, so this result is often called the triplets corona theorem. Um, 
And um, there's actually an interesting history of this theorem uh, because in H2, there is a, sort of a precursor by, by Leach. And uh, Leach's paper uh, appeared uh, about 40 years late. And, and the reason is uh, it was first rejected because it wasn't clear what it was good for. And, uh, but then the, uh, the preprint was still circulated and uh, it turned out to be actually quite influential. So after many decades, uh, people went back and actually, and then it actually got published. And so uh, this is sometimes why people call it Leach's theorem as well. Okay. So this is all I'm going to say about, uh, about Corona. Um, uh, let me try to interface with something else that we saw in this uh, focus program, which, uh, so there was one week about interpolation and sampling and about interpolating sequences and sampling sets. So, so let me try to talk about this. Um, so as you may recall, an interpolating sequence uh, for H infinity is, is a sequence Z in the disk uh, for which the, uh, um, the evaluation map is subjective, right? So in other words, for every uh, sequence W and in L infinity, you can find a, a function in, in H infinity that takes those values. Uh, that sends Z into WN for each N. So, so, so as, as you may know, the, the way to think about this is to think that the, these points are spread out in the disk so much uh, that you can uh, choose the values of your functions of your function in H infinity to be essentially independently. Uh, uh, you can choose these, these values essentially independently at these points. And so people are interested in interpolating sequences, for instance, because they tell you a lot about the maximum ideal space of H infinity. Um, uh, Alex Bodney also explained that uh, Carlson's study of interpolating sequences was sort of a, a precursor to his, his corona construction. So that's another reason why, um, why I might be interested in these. And so Carlson characterized them and, and there, are, there, are, there are two conditions that, that show up. Uh, namely, uh, you have a weak separation condition and a Carlson measure condition. And, and so the weak separation condition means that uh, you can find an epsilon so that uh, any two distinct uh, points are separated by, by epsilon in the hyperbolic metric or the pseudo hyperbolic metric. And so, so, the, so this thing here is the, uh, this is usually called the pseudo hyperbolic metric between Zn and Zm. And you want this to be at least epsilon. And then there's a Carlson measure condition, uh, which uh, says that you have a constant so that this, uh, this sum here is, is bounded above by a constant times uh, the norm of your function squared in the Hardy space, right? So we've seen Carlson measures before, and this says that the discrete measure that assigns to Zn this weight here is, uh, is a Carlson measure for the Hardy space H2, right? So, so very roughly speaking, uh, weak separation prevents the points from bunching up, and the Carlson measure condition ensures that they, they go to infinity fast enough in, in some very vague sense. So Carlson proved that a sequence is interpolating if and only if it's, it satisfies both, right? If and only if it's weakly separated, and it satisfies the Carlson measure condition. And once you know this, you can give lots of examples. Uh, for instance, if, you're, if the moduli tend to one exponentially fast, then you have an interpolating sequence. Okay. Um, so you can ask similar things in the Dreyerson space. And, uh, and in fact, you can, uh, you can ask this in, in every complete pick space. So I'm, I'm formulating things for complete pick spaces now, but uh, you can just think of the Dreyerson space. It, uh, it doesn't make a difference. And it's, uh, it's also interesting in the case of the Dreyerson space and, and, and non-trivial. Uh, so if you have a, a complete pick space, um, then there are sort of obvious analogs of, uh, of all these conditions here. Um, namely, you can uh, define an interpolating sequence, uh, which is a sequence for which the evaluation map from the multiplier algebra into little l infinity is subjective. So again, for every bounded sequence of complex numbers, you find a multiplier that takes these values. Uh, then there is a version of uh, the weak separation condition, uh, which uh, involves another metric, uh, which is defined in terms of the reproducing kernel. So you can work out if you take the, 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 the Ziegler kernel here, and it's not completely trivial, the computation, but uh, you can do it, um, that, that this, is, this essentially works out to be the pseudo hyperbolic metric on the disk. So if you're thinking of the, of the Dreyerson space, then this works out to be a separation in the pseudo hyperbolic metric on the ball. So this is, uh, this is also a pretty concrete geometrical condition. And then again, there's the Carlson measure condition, uh, which is essentially the same thing, but the weight is now uh, given by the reciprocal of the kernel. Uh, so we have a, um, uh, so, so the, the discrete measure that assigns to Zn, uh, this, uh, this weight here is a Carlson measure for the, for the Hilbert space. And so in, uh, in 94, Bishop and Marshall and Sandberg proved that Carlson's theorem holds in the Dirichlet space. So a sequence is interpolating uh, 
uh, if and only if it's both weakly separated and it satisfies the Carlos measure condition. And uh, this uh, proof of Marshall and Sandberg actually did use the, uh, the complete pick, prop pick property of the Dirichlet space. Um, and as far as I know, this was one of the first uh, sort of big theorems that, that made uh, non-trivial use of the, of the complete pick property uh, in some space. And uh, so, so there, there was some more work, which I'm uh, sort of brutally cutting out. There was some work by, by Burr, for instance, um, for, for some of these spaces in this scale. Um, but uh, a couple of years ago, um, the four of us, Alman, McCarthy, Richter, and I, uh, showed that this, that this Carlson interpolation theorem extends to all com uh, complete pick spaces. And in particular, it extends to the Dre Allison space. Um, so uh, this does give a characterization of interpolating sequences uh, in the case of the Dre Allison space, which is uh, weak separation in the Carlson measure condition. Um, the proof we had uh, in, in 2017 used. Uh, a big hammer used the, the solution of the Caddis and Singer problem due to Marcus Spielmann and Shivastava. Um, Caddis and Singer was known to be equivalent to many things, um, one of which was the Feistinger conjecture. And uh, the Feistinger conjecture in this context says that every Carlson sequence is a finite union of interpolating sequences. So you can imagine that without going into detail, so this would probably help you out in the proof. And uh, this is what we used. Um, uh, there's now an argument which, uh, which avoids this, uh, which uses uh, what's known as the column row property. And uh, I might say a few words about this at the end if I have time. Um, okay, so, so that's what I wanted to say about interpolating sequences. Um, then there was another week at this workshop, which was about uh, BMO and uh, Hunkel operators and H1 and H1 BMO duality. Uh, so let me try to connect to that as well. Uh, so as you probably know, uh, H1 is the space of all holomorphic functions on the disk uh, where these uh, L1 integrals here are, are finite or the super where these L1 integrals is finite. And uh, so I think with this audience, no one needs convincing that, that one, should, uh, one should look at H1 as well, even if you only care about Hilbert space. Uh, so uh, then the question is, what's the replacement of H1 for the dre allison space or for the Dirichlet space? I can ask either. And uh, you could try to take the function theory definitions and then replace the L2 norm with an L1 norm, but uh, that uh, doesn't quite have the same properties as H1 has. So instead, you can do something else. You can mimic, you can try to mimic this basic fact, namely that a function is an H1, uh, if and only if it's a product of two functions in H2. And so this, uh, this idea was taken up by, or, or was, this idea is due to uh, Kaufman, Rockberg, and Weiss, uh, who in the 70s proved that if you have a reproducing kernel Hilbert space, and then the weak product of, uh, of H is, um, well, then they define the, the, the weak product of H. And, and so the, the first attempt you can do is you can say, well, uh, you take the set of all products of functions in H. Uh, but then you think about it for a second, and then you realize, well, why should this even be a vector space, right? It's, uh, it's kind of a miracle that it is a vector space in the case of, case of H2. Okay, fine, then you take finite sums of products. Um, but then, uh, well, if you want to do serious functional analysis, then you really want uh, your spaces to be complete. So then you take infinite sums of products. And uh, the convergence assumption uh, that, that turns out to be natural is this uh, one that's reminiscent of the projective tensor product of, of two Banach spaces. So um, this you can define a norm uh, using this on this uh, weak product because you just take the info of all representations on the right. And then this is a Banach function space. Um, and so you can try to study that. And this is supposed to be the replacement for H1. Okay, so if this is H1, then, then, then where, is, where are the Hunkel operators and where is BMO? Well, here the Hunkel forms at least. Uh, so a Hunkel bilinear form, uh, it has a simple function in H and uh, it's a densely defined bilinear form uh, on, on H, uh, which uh, just takes two functions in H and uh, multiplies them together and, and uh, takes the inner product with B. So with a simple function B. Now for the product to make sense, uh, let's assume that one of these functions is in the multiplier algebra. Um, and uh, under, under mild conditions, so for instance, if you have a normalized complete pick space, uh, then the, the multiplier algebra is dense. So this is densely defined. And um, uh, so we can look at the space of all uh, symbols that give you a bounded bilinear form. Because when it's bounded, then it extends to the whole, uh, to the whole of H. And so when you have a bounded uh, a bilinear form, then uh, bilinear form on H is the same as a, as a dual, as, a, as an operator from H into its dual, which is the, uh, the complex conjugate Hilbert space. 
right? Because the, the linear dual is the complex conjugate space. And so you get uh, an operator HB from H into the complex conjugate space, which is uh, which is really works like a Hunkel operator. Uh, so it, it just represents this, uh, this bilinear form that I mentioned above here. Um, if you know about Hunkel operators, this is a, this is a little Hunkel operator, right? It's a, I mean, the big and little Hunkel operators, this is a little one. Now, um, uh, in, the, in the case of H2, uh, there's an old theorem of Nihari, uh, which you can rephrase as saying that uh, the Hunkel, uh, so, so all the Bs that give you bounded uh, um, bilinear forms on, on H2 is exactly the dual space of H1. And uh, then, then Pfefferman showed that uh, this is actually uh, the space BMOA, the space of uh, functions of bounded mean oscillation with uh, which, which are analytic. And so, so there is a version of this Nihari theorem uh, uh, here. Uh, so, I mean, it's uh, Kaufman, Rockberg, and Weiss observed that often you get, if you have weak products, often you get some kind of duality with, with Hunkel forms. Uh, in the case of the Drew-Allison space, uh, this is a special case of a theorem of Richter and Sundberg. Um, that the dual space of the weak product of the uh, of the Dreyer's space is the space of Hunkel form. So this is supposed to generalize H1 BMOA duality. Um, uh, it turns out this is true in any complete pick space, uh, which satisfies uh, this uh, this technical property called the Colombo property. Okay, uh, let me also uh, mention uh, a, uh, in my opinion, very remarkable result of, of Julian Martin. Uh, which says that if you have a complete pick space, which again satisfies this, this technical assumption, then actually the weak product becomes much simpler. Then uh, every function in the weak product factors as a product of two functions in the Hilbert space. Uh, so you don't need the, the sums and certainly not the infinite sums. And uh, what I really like about this theorem is that um, this was an open problem in the Dirichlet space even. And so this solved the open problem in the Dirichlet space, but the proof uses NC function theory. Right. So if you think about it, the Dirichlet space is a space of functions of a single variable. So my, what should there be non-commutative? But what they do is they take the Dirichlet space, they, they lift everything to the Dreyavison space in infinitely many variables, then they lift it even further to the NC Hardy space, and, and then they solve it in the NC Hardy space. And so some things become much more amenable in the, in the NC world, and this, is, this, this, this seems to be one of them. And so uh, I think this is... Uh, it's really quite amazing that you use non-commutative function theory in infinitely many variables to solve a problem about the Dirichlet space in one variable. Um, there was also, um, so I guess uh, maybe by now you believe that if you have a, uh, a space of functions, then you should look at the multipliers. Uh, so then clearly you should look at the multipliers of the weak product. And uh, so there's something that I did with Rafael Cloatra uh, where we showed that again, under the same assumptions, uh, the multipliers of the weak products are the same as the multipliers of the Hilbert space. So this is supposed to remind you of the fact that the multipliers of the of H1 are the same as, as are H infinity, which is the same as the multipliers of H2. Um, curiously enough, our, our proof uh, uses sort of an operator space approach to these uh, to these weak product spaces, uh, which is sort of different from uh, uh, some things you see in the literature, where there's usually approach using using more harmonic analysis. Okay, so let me finish up by, by briefly saying one word about this, this technical property, this, this column row property. And um, since this is about the Dreyavison space, I can try to motivate it using a basic fact in the Dreyavison space. Namely, uh, if, if we have um, these coordinate multipliers, then we know that they form a row contraction. Um, but if you stick them into a column, the norm gets much bigger. It turns out to be square root of D. And so there is some asymmetry between norms of rows and norms of columns. And, uh, the question is, so it's, it's possible that the, the, the norm of the row is bigger, uh, the norm of the column is bigger than the norm of the row. And the question is, can it also go the other way? And so, so th this turned into a definition. Um, maybe, uh, so space is said to satisfy the column row property with some constant. If the norm of the row for any sequence is at most the constant times the norm of the column. So that uh, in the Dreyavison space, at least in this very particular example, uh, we see that the norm of the row is bounded by the norm of the column, but uh, in general, it's not so clear. And so also the reason why this, uh, uh, why people started caring about this is because it kept popping up as an assumption in these theorems. And so the first uh, uh, non-trivial result in this direction is uh, I think to, to trend to show that the Dirichlet space satisfies the column row property. And there were some other uh, results, positive results by Alman McCarthy-Richter, myself and by James Pasco, for instance. And this is, uh, 
uh, remarkably something that does fail in the non-commutative world. So there, there, or God drew in Pascal showed that the column O property fails in the NC Hardy space. Um, but it turns out now um, you can actually go back and, and cross it out as an assumption uh, because last, uh, last year I showed that uh, every complete pick space satisfies this column O property with constant one. So um, you don't have to worry about it anymore. You can, uh, you can just ignore it in these, in these terms. Okay, so uh, that's the end uh, of my lecture series. Uh, let me, let me uh, uh, try to give a very quick summary. Uh, so the drury allison space is a space of uh, functions on the open ball that's supposed to generalize classical Hardy space. It plays a universal role in two seemingly different subjects in a multivariable operator theory and in the theory of complete pick spaces. We have many different points of view, which in my opinion, make for a very rich theory. And um, in particular, these, uh, the, this uh, approach using complete pick spaces gives an approach to some classical function spaces like the Dirichlet space that's, uh, that's useful for, uh, for certain problems. So, so thanks for, for sticking around and, and that's it. Thank you indeed, Michael. Let's thank him first for this wonderful series of lectures. Any question or comments for Michael? Sure. Uh, can I make, I'd like to make a comment about the um, Triplet's Corona theorem. Um, you mentioned this paper by Leach, which I hadn't heard of, but uh, you didn't mention the paper by Arvison. Yeah. So Arvison's paper is from 75. So that's um, what, 45 years ago or something. Um, and it's his paper on, on nest algebras where he proves the uh, distance formula to nests and proves a number of other things. And, but it be, it's a clear that if you look at what he's doing in that paper and you look at the last section that he was trying to find an operator theoretic proof of the Corona theorem. And he doesn't quite succeed, but he proves this, what's become known as the Toplitz Corona theorem in H2. Yeah. And uh, it's sort of buried in that paper now um, because the paper became important for its work on nest algebras and uh, hasn't, wasn't so much known for that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that comment. Yeah. Uh, I think I think Leach didn't realize that that you could do this. Uh, you know that, that you could say something about Corona using his approach because surely if he had uh, realized this, then he would have pointed out in his paper, and then it would have been rejected. I guess. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Ken. There was a question in the chat. Uh, ah. You see it, uh, Michael. Um, yeah, so does there exist a triplet corona type theorem for spaces with, uh, with C and P factors? Uh, yes, there, uh, there's a version of this, of this uh, sort of, so the, the, this Leach theorem uh, is, is usually stated more generally, and there's a version of this Leach theorem for spaces with C and P factors, but you need to replace multipliers from one space into itself with multipliers from one space into the, the other. So you get multipliers from um, the, uh, the complete pick space into the, the space of the C and P factor. Um, so it's not so clear what it says about Corona really, but, but there's a version of it at least. Okay, and, and, and B is there an example where the multiplier algebra the weak product, but the H does not satisfy the column O property. Um, I mean, there are plenty of examples where it's not a complete big space. Uh, because, for instance, if you take uh, H to be H2 on the ball, so Hardy space on the ball, then the weak product is H1 and the multipliers are both H infinity. Um, I'm not sure about examples where you don't have where you don't have the column row property. I mean, uh, this column row property has has really only been I mean, so far at least been useful in the context of of, of complete pick spaces. So I'm, so I'm not sure people have really looked into it in great detail in spaces that are not complete pick spaces. Thanks, Michael. Further comments or questions? Yeah, um, Michael, in your uh, Corona theorem. Um, there's in a lot of spaces, there's like a part two of the Corona theorem, which is an upper bound for the uh, sum of the moduli. And I think the yeah. classical Corona theorem, it's like log delta over delta, to maybe some power. So is there a version of that? Uh, so, so, so in the, uh, in the triplets Corona theorem, uh, so, 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 so let me go back. Uh, in the triplets Corona theorem, you, you get the, uh, the best possible upper bound you could hope for uh, in some sense. Um, so where was it? 
I'm struggling to go back here. This, this Zoom interface is really not all that uh, easy to handle, I must say. Um, almost right. there we are yes so so in this um in this triplet corner theorem you get the best possible upper bound because you can get the uh, um so so saying that this uh this this row is subjective uh, means that there is uh, some kind of right inverse with with some bound and uh you get that the column norm of these ci's here is exactly that bound so 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 this is if you if you say that let me rephrase it. If you say that M phi i stop M phi i M phi i star is greater than or equal to delta times the identity, uh, then you get that the uh, the column of these uh, C i's uh, has norm at most. Uh, I guess if I phrase it well, let me say delta squared, then you get one over delta. Right? So, right. so this is the, the the best possible bound you could hope for. But the problem is that this assumption here is not a pointwise assumption. It's an assumption about the operators. So, so in the, the usual Cournot theorem. The, uh, the lower bound you have is a pointwise lower bound, not a lower bound on the operators. Right, yeah. Okay, yeah, because for the, uh, in uh, like H2, there's a, yeah. an upper bound thing, you know, the soup of the upper bound, you're right. It's like one over log delta over delta is yeah. a power, yeah. Okay. Yeah, but here the assumption is stronger because you're, you're, you're not, so if, if you test this thing on reproducing kernels, then you get the pointwise lower bound, but this is stronger than just, uh, asking for a point by slower bound, and therefore right. the conclusion is stronger as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's thank Michael again. Yeah. Michael, are, are you going to share the slides with the particip participants? Uh, yes, I mean I'm going to upload them in the in the chat right now. Okay, please.